Hello everyone and welcome, welcome. My name is Roger Phillip, President and CEO of Roger CPA Review. And I'm here today to talk about something called Meet the Firms, or some schools call it Meet the Professionals. This is probably one of the most important events of the year. This is how I got my job many, many years ago at Deloitte & Touche in downtown Los Angeles. First of all, a little bit of background on myself. I went to school in Los Angeles. I then went to work at Deloitte and Touche in downtown LA where I got my CPA certificate. I left there 20 plus years ago, started teaching CPA review and that's all I do full time. My job is to take accounting and give it life, energy, passion, focus you into the key information, help you accomplish your goal, which one day is to sit for and successfully complete the CPA exam, which I'll talk about a little bit later. A little bit about Roger CPA review. We've been in business over 10 years. We're the fastest growing review course. We have location all over the country. We're in Japan. We're in United Arab Emirates. We are global as well. We have all these different locations. And again, my job is to teach you what you need to know to help you get through the exam. I have contracts with Deloitte, with Ernst, and with hundreds of other firms, governmental, private industry, public accounting as well. What I try to do is focus you in the key information. I have the highest pass rate of any review course, about 86 plus percent. So if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to get through the exam. What are we here to talk about? today, meet the firms. Now with meet the firms, what is meet the firms? We'll talk about how to properly prepare for this event so you walk in as prepared as possible, success, professional choices, and a little bit about the exam itself. Now, first of all, what is Meet the Firms? It's basically an informal reception, an informal cocktail party. And all of these professionals come in, and what happens is they have these beautiful tables set up, and you'll have all the students, and everyone's kind of nervous, and they're dressed in their outfits and so forth, and all their little suits. And what I'll tell people is, I always say, if I'm at the event, come to our table first, and I'll give you a bag. Now, the cool thing about this bag is it gives you a chance to collect all these wonderful things. And I go to maybe 20, 30 of these things a year, and we've collected all this wonderful stuff. Like I've got, for example, these cool pens or these highlighters. Also, one of the cool things, too, they give you things like calculators. Do, 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 do. Pretty cool, huh? Opens up like that. Free! Can you believe it? You get things like letter openers. The other thing you'll notice all the firms give out, they like to give away mints. Mints. I always tell people, grab these things first. Why? They're not giving these out for any other reason other than what? Because sometimes your breath is not good, right? You go up to a professional, hi, I'm Rog Phillip, nice to meet you. And they're crying and you're like, oh, they're so emotional. No, it's your breath. So I always tell people, grab these things first. But it's not just like all these free tchotchkes that you're getting. You know, it's kind of like Halloween came early. Trick or treat, right? And you get all these freebies. No, you're there to get knowledge and information about the firms. That's why you're there, to get the brochures, to get the information, to actually meet the people that work in public accounting. These are the people that you're going to be working with for many, 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 many hours. So think of it this way. I'm a recruiter and I have 20 positions to fill. Your goal is to be one of those 20 people. How do I know you exist? One way is an amazing resume, right? I've got a 4.2 GPA. We all know these people. We all hate these people, right? They ruin the curve. Most of us don't have a 403836 necessarily. So the other way that I'm gonna get familiar with you is through this very important event called what? Called Meet the Firms. So basically, there's a nice big room set up, they have tables set up with table skirts and billboards, but also the flyers and the actual professionals. They may send a partner, a manager, a recruiter, some new hire. So all of these are the people that your goal is to get in there and for five to 10 minutes to impress them, to make them feel like, wow, this is someone that I want to work for my firm. So think about it. I'm a recruiter. I've got 20 positions. Your goal is to be one of those 20. One way, an amazing resume. The other way is someone that I am familiar with. Now, a lot of people say, well, when should I go to meet the firms? I always tell people that you want to go as early as possible, right? Look how young he is. You want to start as soon as possible. I always tell people practice makes perfect. Because if you go to this event and I'm about to graduate in three months or six months, you've waited too long. I tell people to go as soon in their career as they can. So let's say you can go in your second or third or fourth year of school, that's when you want to go. Because that way if you make a mistake, you have time to recover. If I graduate in six months and I don't do a good job at this event, I'm not going to get a job offer. But if I don't graduate for two and a half years, hey, I'll get better each semester as I continue to go to this event. So you walk up to the partner, hi, hey, I heard you guys got sued, right? Open mouth, insert foot. Well, at least if I graduate in three years, I've got time to recover. <laughs> Hopefully by then they'll forget who I 
who I am as far as that. So again, the whole goal is to realize what you want out of this event. I always tell people to realize that guess what? You're not looking for a job, you're looking for a career. Right? A job is what you did in school to help pay your tuition and room and board and stuff like that. The career is what you're going to be doing for many, many, many years. That's what this event is. This event is for you to gain exposure to all the different wonderful career opportunities that are available in the field of accounting. So, what are, about, what are employers looking for? They're looking for things like your poise, your confidence, how you communicate. Because realize, when I worked at Deloitte, there were times when I was working with, let's say, two or three other people. And we're working in this huge conference room overlooking downtown LA. And I'm out there, I'm ticking and tying and footing and cross-footing and all that. Other times, you're working in wherever they have room for you. So you're working in the, uh, in the coffee room next to the vending machine. Mm, and it's humming all day. And you're sitting there with a manager and a senior and a semi-senior and you, the new hire. And you're ticking and tying and, and you're all sitting this crunched up. So as a recruiter, I want to find someone who blends well with my staff. I'm not just looking for a 4.0. I'm looking for someone who is a well-balanced individual, someone who has good communication skills, someone who has self-confidence, someone who is able to carry on a conversation. Because when I worked at Deloitte, my job was to go out and pick up management's financial statements. And I brought in my Boeing financial statements. Whose statements are these? You'll learn this in auditing. Management's. Management is responsible for the preparation. Management is responsible for the content. Our job as an auditor is to obtain sufficient, appropriate audit evidence so it affords us a reasonable basis for expressing an opinion on these numbers. So if my job is to go out and let's say my job is to give an opinion and audit the balance sheet. Now what's the first balance on the balance sheet? Cash and cash equivalents, right? What's cash? That's that green stuff you carry around, makes you popular, gets you friends, gets you dates, right? What's a cash equivalent? It is a highly liquid original maturity of three months or less. So as an auditor, my job is to corroborate, substantiate that cash was presented fairly. So there's certain assertions you'll learn in auditing. You perceive understandability and classification, presentation and disclosure, existence and occurrence, rights and obligations, completeness, cutoff, valuation, allocation, accuracy. These are the different assertions that management makes. Your job as an auditor is to obtain evidence so at the end of the audit, you can draft an audit opinion. What does the audit opinion say? I'll teach you in class. <gasps> in our opinion, the statements referred to above presents fairly in all material specs, financial position, blah, blah, blah. So that's what the opinion says. So what that means is I had to go out, and even though I was just a new hire, I had to go talk to fixed assets managers. I'm talking to CEOs, CFOs, presidents, controllers, bookkeepers. So the client, the recruiter is looking for someone who has good communication skills because you've got to be able to talk to the client and obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. You can't be real. So when you go to this event, they don't want to see someone, hi, I'm Roger, I'm kind of quiet and shy. They want to see your leadership skills. They want to see, in fact, that you have those communication skills. So it's really important to show the recruiter that you can do all of these things. That's why it's so important. Now, I always tell people, take time to research the firms. Some schools I go to, they have eight or 10 firms come out. Some schools have 50 or 60 firms. That means you better do your homework up front because I may only have three hours to hit, let's say, well, there's 30 firms. That means I've got 10 firms an hour. I've got six minutes a firm. Hi, I'm Roger. Hi, I'm Roger. Hi, I'm Roger. They're not going to remember me at all. So I want to make sure that I can use my time wisely. So what does that mean? Do a little bit of research. That means talk to your accounting club or the faculty and find out who's going to be at the event. Then go on their website. Every firm has a website now. You can start to find out how big the firm is, what kind of clients they deal with, um, what kind of areas they deal with. So that way when you go and you talk to them, you sound like you've done some homework. When I'm looking to hire a new person, the first thing I always ask is, did you take a look at my website? And if they were to say no, it shows me they're not interested in me. Why should I be interested in them? So I always encourage people to make sure that you do your research up front. You want to find out what industry they're in. Are they in finance? Are they in manufacturing, wholesale, retail? What areas? So that way when you go up, you sound a little bit knowledgeable. Oh, I understand you have a location here and a location here. Which location do you work in? Oh, great. Which department do you work in? Oh, how long have you been at the firm? So that way I can get the conversation going, as I'll talk about in just a minute. Also, assess your strengths and weaknesses. Assessing your strengths. What am I good at? I have good communication skills. I present myself professionally. What am I weak in? Those are the areas that, again, and I love this when you do interviews. 
Right? They always ask these behavioral questions. If you could go back and you could, uh, have you ever had a project where other people weren't participating? How did you handle that? You know, they also love to ask, you know, what's your biggest weakness? You know, I drink and smoke too much and I'm lazy. No, you don't want to answer that one. You want to say something like, I'm a workaholic, right? Uh, you want to say something where, again, it's kind of a positive or it's hard for me to hand something in unless I know that it's really complete and it's, I've really done a really good job at it. So sometimes I spend a little bit more time doing it to make sure it's really thorough. So that's one of the areas I have to work on. But think about that in advance, your strengths, your weaknesses. Talk to students who have been through the event. And a lot of times I'll say, like people in your club, accounting association, beta alpha psi, you say, hey, who's been to the event? Tell me what it's like. The person says, oh, it's really boring. All I get is free swag. Don't talk to them. You want to talk to the person that says, it was great. I met some, made some really good contacts. And these are the people down the road who are going to, for example, be able to hire me one day. Also, how you dress is really important. I always like to tell people, you never get a second chance to make a good first impression. So you want to make sure that you're making a wonderful first impression. So that means your clothing is very important. Your clothing should be a source of confidence. In other words, you want to wear something that after the event nobody remembers. You don't want people to go, did you see what she was wearing? Woo, couldn't believe, you know, that's not what you want. You want something that blends in. I always tell people as a gentleman, maybe a dark suit, something professional. One of the ways we can be really wild is you can wear like a loud tie or a loud shirt, something like that. But you, again, your clothing should be a source of confidence. For women, maybe a dress, uh, a skirt and a blouse or a pants suit, something like that. But again, the clothing Clothing shouldn't be getting in the way. They shouldn't be a distractor. Another thing, uh, back when I was in college, you know, I was trying to be cool, and, and I had earrings. I had hoops. Hoops. There it is, right? So I had some hoops. And so for this event, what did I do? I took them out. Why? Because I didn't want it to be a distraction. I didn't want them to focus on this. I wanted them to focus on me. Then later on, maybe I would put one back in. But right now, I want to make a good first impression, so I want to act professional, dress professional, look professional, sound professional, and so on. Back when I was in college, believe it or not, I looked really, really young. All right, you laugh, just wait, give yourself 20 years. But all of a sudden, I looked really young. So I said, what can I do to make myself look older, right? Because I would go up and I, I looked like Justin Bieber. Hi, everybody, I'm Roger. I really need a job, right? So I'm like, okay, well, so what I did is I wore glasses. I put on glasses. Why? Because when you look with glasses, somehow you look older, more mature, you also look more intelligent. All right, look around the room with the glasses, right? It's not always the truth, but it really helps to at least set, because I didn't want to look like a young party guy. I wanted to look intelligent, so I actually put on my glasses. That way I could make sure that it was, again, they were looking at me as who I am. The other thing I always say is as you dress, same thing earlier, take a mint. Put a mint in your mouth before you go up and go, hi, I'm Roger. And they're like, whoa. So again, all these little things. Because if you go up and you look great, but you've got terrible breath, they're not going to hire you. Because they've got so many people, especially in this economy, there's so many people looking for that same job. You want to set yourself apart from the rest, but in a very positive way. So that's why it's so important to, again, to kind of assess yourself, to take a look at yourself, to figure out what you're going to be doing. Um, another thing back in, this is how old I am, back in the day I had a tail, you know, because I thought it was cool. Not a mullet, that's different, but a tail. So I remember, I didn't want to cut it off yet because I, you know, I wasn't graduating. So what I did is I hid it in my, sh in my shirt. The problem was when I turned my head, whoop, it would kind of pop out like, hey, there it is. So I kind of hit. But the whole point was I wanted to put it aside so it wasn't a distractor from who I am and what it is they're looking for. So again, I always tell people to kind of think about that as far as what you're wearing. It should be a source of confidence. So that way afterwards, again, you feel comfortable with how you communicated. Now, you want to make a good first impression. So what does that mean? When you go to the event, they usually have a name tag. Where do you put your name tag? You put it on the right side so when you're shaking hands, they can see your name. If you put it on this side, they can't see it. So you always want to put it on this side so when you're reaching your hand out, they can still see, oh, that's his name. So you always put it on the right side. Now, you get to this event, Show up early. The event starts at 6, get there at 5.30. Give yourself a chance to get lost. A lot of people get nervous at this event, especially if this is their first time. So I want you to stay calm. Take some deep breaths, right? Get there early. Sit in the car. I took a couple of shots of caffeine, right, just to kind of wake up and make sure I was ready. Then you get there, you get your name tag, door opens, you walk in. You walk into this room, there's 20 tables, there's 50 tables. All the professionals are standing there behind the tables. They're waiting for you to come up. 
Realize the whole purpose of this event is to promote interaction. They want you to go up. They want you to talk to them. It's not like you're just going to a bar. Hey, what's your sign? You know, stop, right? But you're going in there to meet these people. They are happy to be there. Why are they happy to be there? They got to leave the office at like 1.30 today, you know, and drive over and set up their table and be all ready for you when you walked in. So they're excited to be there. They're ready to meet you. So you want to make a good first impression. You go up to the table. You shake their hands. The handshake is so important. Have you ever shaken someone's hand and it's like a dead fish? Hi, I'm Roger, right? No, no. We want a nice, firm handshake. You don't want to break their fingers, right? Ah, You lose. But you want to give a calm, confident message. You want them to feel like this is someone that I could work with. Because realize, how many of you have friends in public accounting, right? And what are they working? What, 25, 30 hours a week? (laughs) More like 50, 60. You're working a lot of hours a week. So they want to make sure that it's someone that they can sit with for 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week, a table this large with four people at it. This is your chance to give them that impression. So you go up, give them a nice firm handshake, give them eye contact. Hi, I'm Roger Phillip. Remember, it's not a staring contest. You lose, right? But you also don't want to be like, hi, I'm Roger Phillip, and you kind of not. You know, you've met those people that can't make eye contact. It doesn't make me feel comfortable. I feel like I can't trust them. So this is your chance. Good first impression. Good posture. It's not like, hi, I'm Roger, and you're kind of sloopy, and hi, and, and you want to go in there, hi, I'm Roger Phillip, nice to see you. Calm, confident, professional, firm handshake, good eye contact, looking at them. Same thing when I interviewed. When I did my in-house interviews, and I got a lot of job offers, instead of sitting in the chair like this, yeah, tell me about your firm, I dare you. I sat on the edge of the seat, wow, tell me more, tell me more. This is, so I sat on the edge of the seat like everything they had to say was amazing. And guess what? It worked. So you need to do the same thing. You kind of take a look at yourself and see what's going on. Now, we're dressed properly. We got our name tag on. We look good. We're ready. What happens? What most of us end up doing is we play the stand around game. You walk in and you get there and you got your suit. And some of the events have food because they may charge you to go to this event. 10, 20, 30, 40 dollars, depending on if you're a member of the club or not. So you get to this event. And what a lot of students do is they go, wow, well, I paid 20 bucks to go. I'm going to go eat my $20 worth of food. And they go to the food and they go, nom, 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 nom. dude, slow down. I tell people, eat before you go. Right? Go to Taco Bell or something. Well, careful, you may not want to go there. But go somewhere before the event. So that way, when you get to the event, boom. When they say go, you've got three hours to hit 30, 40, 50 firms. And I want to make a positive impression. I want them to remember who I am. So I don't go to these events to eat. I go to these events to schmooze. It's a schmooze fest. This is your chance to make a great impression. So I'm going to go up and talk to these people and let them know who I am and what it is I have to offer them because I have so much to offer them in their firm, but I've only got three, four, five, six minutes to convince them that I am going to be a good part of that firm. So again, we walk in. We don't just go to the food. We don't just stand around the wall and go, let's talk. You get out and schmooze. Now, I always tell people sometimes it's better to make up, break up into groups because maybe two of us together, I feel a little more comfortable. That's fine. But be careful. You don't want to go in a group of like 20 people. What will happen is somehow women are better at this. Like women will go two by two. You know, it's like no one in the art. So they'll go up and talk to the per- recruiter. And you've got a recruiter there who's great. They're outgoing. They're personable. Obviously, that's why they got hired, right? They're not going to hire, the firm's not going to hire a recruiter who's boring. Hi, I'm the recruiter. We work hard and we play hard. No, they're going to hire somebody who's out. So all of a sudden, if you're there with one other person, they're going to have a conversation and remember you. What we do as guys is we move around like a pack, like a pack of wolves. We go, there's a recruiter. Come on. And then there's like five of us and here's the recruiter. She's not going to remember any of us. So I always encourage people to break off again. Get out on your own or maybe with one other person. That way you can get out and you can meet the people but also have them remember who you are. So get off to a good start. Go with a friend or meet your friend there. Treat it as a learning experience. Arrive on time. I also tell people to bring copies of their resumes because some schools, what they do, which is great, they prepare this thing called a resume book. So they may have a resume book that has all the resumes in it already and then all the firms get it. But maybe the table only got one book and the table sent four people. So what I tell people is bring your resumes and then carry them around. Now, I don't suggest you walk around with a big stack of resumes going, resumes, who wants the resume? No. What I want you to do is take the resume, put it in, you know, like a Roger folder, put it in something like that. So you're just walking around with your resume like this and you're walking around. And then when you meet 
someone, you start to talk to them and say, oh, would you mind if I gave you one of my resumes? Sure. Then they're going to take it and they're going to write notes in that. That way they can remember who you are. Again, in life, it's not only what you know, but who you know. And this is the event where you're going to get to meet the right people because these are the people that do the hiring. So you want to make a good first impression. That is your chance. What is a resume? It's a picture of your past and present accomplishments. Now, at this point in our life, most of us haven't done very much, right? We've been in college for 20 years. You know, not college. I hope not college. We've been in school for 20 plus years. So we haven't done much. But realize most of your resumes look similar. You've taken the same classes, the same professors, and so on. So you want to show your uniqueness. A lot of times that starts with objective. Don't just say to obtain entry-level position in the field of accounting. <gasps> Boring. Use descriptive verbs to use my high energy and my great communication skills in the field of accounting. Because now what I'm saying is, hey, I've got a lot of energy, I hope I do, and I have great communication skills. That's what you're purporting, that's what you're saying about yourself. Now I've got five or six minutes to show it. So make it that way. Also, show your uniqueness. I speak 27 languages, I lived overseas, I ski, I snowboard, I do all this fun stuff. The reason I wanna mention that, is when I went on a lot of in-houses and you would have recruiters meet you and they would interview and they're great interviewers. Then they would say, well, let's have you meet with this manager who just happens to be in the office that day. And guess what? That manager isn't really outgoing, not a great interviewer, but they go here. So he has your resume and he's looking at it to find something to talk about. And all of a sudden it says, taking Roger CP review and he goes, I took Roger. And all of a sudden you spend 20 minutes talking about me. Guess what? You have a good time, you get a job. Or it says, snowboard, you snowboard, where did you go? Oh, you lived in Europe for three months, where? So did I. So all of a sudden, again, it's not always what you talk about. It's how the communication goes. It's how the rapport, what kind of rapport. If after that 20 or 30 or six minutes at a meet the firm, the person goes, wow, I could have talked to this guy for hours, that's great. So it's really important that you think about that before the event, so you want to strategize. So again, bringing your resume is important. Make 30 copies, for example, and that way you've got them. But again, showing your uniqueness. You still want to show your past experiences, but you want to take those experiences and focus them into the industry you're looking in, which is accounting. So let's say, for example, the only job I had is I worked at, at Starbucks as a barista. I'm a barista, right? So what do I say? Uh, what was my job? People would come up and go, I'll have a coffee. Okay, here's the money. <laughs> Boom. Make it. Give it to them. Ew, this isn't low fat. It's non-fat. So what would I say? Dealt with financial transactions, right? Took the money. Uh, this is the wrong drink. Conflict resolution. See what I'm saying? But the point is, even though that's all I did, what I'm showing them is how it relates to the industry that I'm heading into, which is what? Which is public accounting. The other thing is strategize your targets. As I said, depending on the size of the event, if it's only three hours, some are two hours, you may not have time to hit every firm. So what I tell people is don't just start with the firm that you really want because I want to warm up. I always tell people if my firm is at the event, then come to our table first, warm up with us. You know, come in, you have a backpack, leave it at my table. Come in and go, Raj, I'm really nervous. I don't know. Boom, I'll slap you, right? Snap out of it. I'll shake you a little bit. But the point is, I need you to relax. I need you to be you. I need you to give and make a good first impression. So calm down. So if I go to an event and I know I want to talk to Deloitte, but guess what? I'm going to start with Schlock and Schlock CPAs. Why? Because it gives me a chance to relax, to practice, to calm down. So I might work with three or four different firms first, then I'll go over to the firm that I know I like. And maybe when I talk to some of these other firms that I had no intention of talking to, I talk to them and find out they're a better fit for me than the firm I thought I wanted. So always keep your options open, but strategize your targets. So I start with this firm, then I go to that firm, then I go to this firm. Now I'm calm and confident, then we go to the firm that I think I really want. Why is that? Because if I blow it, at least it was a firm that I wasn't interested. Hi, oh yeah, you guys got sued. Wow, that's not good. Hey, I hear you guys have no female partners. Is that a problem? Have you gotten... Yeah, that's not a good approach. So let me get that out of the way first. The other reason is I talk to the firm and they go, yeah, our average work week's 37 hours a week. We're a business management firm, so we have clients like blah, 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 all these movie stars. You go, that sounds great. And our starting salary is 120 grand a year. Pfft, dude, where do I sign up? So again, you want to give everyone a chance in the sense of talking to all the firms, but you've got to pace yourself. So what I would do is warm up, then go to the firm that I really like, talk to all the people, go back, talk to more people. Throughout the night, I would keep kind of visiting that firm so they remember me. I'm planting that seed, planting that seed. Again, they're gonna hire 20 people. 
I want to be more than just a resume. I want them to know who I am. I want them to remember me. I want them at the end to reach out and want me to be a member of their firm. So again, strategize, but also relax. So begin the conversation. Now, Everyone says, what should I talk about? The good news is this. They generally are not asking you about accounting specific topics. So what do you think about pension accounting? What do you think about deferred taxes? What I was thinking is deferred taxes, taxes, deferred liability. Well, the final, and it's not that. What do you think about accounting standard? Company? What about IFRS? Do you think about the impact of IFRS? No, 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 no. They just want to see what kind of balance you have. I went through many, 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 many interviews. They never asked me accounting questions. They just wanted to see more behavioral questions, how I communicate. They looked at your GPA. They looked at that kind of stuff, but they wanted to look at who you were more than whether you knew the debits and credits and the actual accounting. How does it affect comprehensive income? What are the journal entries? Derivative, the excess amortization on pensions, foreign currency, net unrealized, available for sale, and so on. So they're not necessarily looking for that. So I like to think ahead of time what kind of questions I want to ask. Also, so I've written up a booklet that talks about what to do, how to dress, everything I'm talking about. It gives a list of questions for partners, for managers, for seniors, for recruiters, for new hires. So that way you can kind of have a list. So what I suggest is you start at the table. When you look at the table, you'll see the old looking person and the young looking person. The young looking person, a lot of times what the firms do is they'll send someone out who just graduated from your school. So this is someone who six months ago was in your accounting club. So that way I go up and go, hey, Bob, how are you? Great to see you. I see that you were just in the accounting association six months ago. How did you get this job? And then you start the conversation. So then I'll talk to them and then I'll say, who's the recruiter? Oh, would you mind introducing me to that person? Well, all of a sudden they're saying, hey, let me introduce you to my friend Roger, who's really good at blah, blah, blah. You're already kind of getting a recommendation from someone that they hired and they obviously liked. So that is a really good way to do it. But what I suggest is I start with this person, then I go to this person, then I work up to the recruiter or the partner or manager. And that way, by the time I get up to that level, I'm feeling more comfortable. Now, as I say, what you talk about is not as important as the relationship or the rapport you create. So I always like to ask questions that are interesting to you. Now, be careful. Don't just have questions on a piece of paper and read them off. So, what did you think about the impact of FASB 167? What are the kind of standard codifications? How does that affect it? If we don't want that. Right? Instead, you want to ask questions like, what office are you in? How long have you been with the firm? What kind of clients do you work with? What's a typical day like for you? What's a typical week like for you? I want to find out. The question I always love, why did you choose this firm? Because I want them to tell me why they chose this firm over other firms. Maybe it's, well, it's the only job offer I got. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully not. But let's say they had different options from big four, national, local, public, private, governmental. I like to know why they chose this firm versus another accounting firm. So those are, again, just some of the questions that I may want to ask so that it helps me. I always say, be a good listener. Because what happens is you're nervous. So you have your little list of questions on your hand and you're like, why did you join the firm? How long have you been there? It's not like you're taking dictation. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you sure about that? You know, it's like you're a police officer or something. You want to listen. You want to, again, be interested and interesting. Think about that, interested and interesting. You want to be interested in what they have to say. You also want to be an interesting person as you respond to their questions. So that if they ask a question, never one word answers. Hey, so I understood you went to this school. Did you like the accounting program? Yup. Okay, very nice. Have you had intermediate two yet? Yup. Right? No, you expand. So I understand, why did you choose this college? Well, I did a lot of research and I realized they have some excellent professors here and I heard they have a great accounting program and that it was easier to get recruited out of this school than some of the other schools. That's why I chose this campus. You see what I'm saying? So think about it. Never one word answers, never just a yes or no. Avoid negative topics. What does that mean? The things about, oh, I understand that you don't have enough minorities at your firm, you don't hire women, you don't give these days, I hear you overwork, I hear your average. So I'm saying negative stuff. No, no, no. No one wants to be around a negative Nelly, right? B, uh, what's that? Um, uh, Debbie Downer, right? You want to be positive, upbeat, happy. You want people to say, I want to work with this person 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week because this person brings positive energy. So think about that. <gasps> Right? Deep breathe heavily before you get up to that table so that you have that energy. End with an open door. 
What does that mean? It means at the end I say, you know, it was great meeting with you and I look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Then I always like to ask, do you have a business card? So then what I'll do is I'll get a business card. They'll say, here you go. I'll say, thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you. Then what I'll do is I'll walk around and write some notes. Now, one of the things that I did when I would meet these people is I would always ask questions like, so I understand you get, what, three weeks vacation and you can bank some time as well. So did you go on any good vacations? Yeah, my family and I, we just went to Maui. Really? I've been to Maui and you start talking about Maui. We did this, we did this, we did this, we did this. That's great. Then after I get the business card, I turn away and I don't do it in front of them, but I walk away and I write notes on the back. He's worked there three years. He's a senior. He works in this department. He went to Maui with his wife and two kids, blah, blah, blah. So I write these notes. These are the things that I want to follow up on afterwards because here's what happens. You'll go to an event and afterwards your friend goes, hey, how was the event? You'll go, it was fabulous. Look at all the business cards I got. And they'll go, wow, that's great. And they'll say, who are these people? And you'll say, I have no idea. I don't remember. So trust me, this happens. so write yourself some notes on the back of each card so you can remember who it was you talked to. What are the interesting? And I always like to get some unique points. So that way when I write them a thank you and they either say, hey, I was the guy with the purple tie or I was the person that we talked about Maui together or, or that way they go, oh, I remember this guy. So I'm going to then follow up promptly and I'm going to write them a thank you note and I'm going to say, hey, it was great to meet you. Thanks for spending time with us. I'm really excited about your first and the opportunities that you have. So again, reinforce your interest in the job. Follow up as, again, it says view as a follow-up sales letter. So you want them to remember who you are. Also, follow up promptly. The other thing too, spell check. Be careful. I mean, if your resume has one spelling error, they're going to throw it out the window. Why? Because they don't want someone that can't proof their own work. So they don't want that. It shows that you're not a complete person. You're not thorough. The other thing is, and I get this question a lot. Can you just send an email? Sure. But it also depends how desperate you are. If I graduate in six weeks and I don't have a job, I am going to hand write a letter, thank you letter to every single person. I'm going to send them an email and I'm going to write a letter. Why? Because an email is easy to get rid of. What do you do? Red X, gone. Bye 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 bye. Versus a letter. You get a thank you letter and they go, oh, this is a nice letter. I hate to throw it. I'll put it on my desk. And then when the recruiter comes in later, they go, here, here's a letter from this guy. He seemed pretty cool. And she goes, oh, I remember him. He had the green tie. So the point is, dare to be different. My example here is the following. One of the things that I remember doing back in my day is the following. I remember being a kid and Elton John, remember Elton John? He was coming out to the Troubadour in LA and uh, we wanted to win tickets. You could win tickets to buy like 200 bucks, which was a lot of money back then, but they were going to do a drawing. So they said, send us a postcard and we're going to pick 20 people and those people get to buy tickets to come to the show. So we sent in three postcards, but guess what? We didn't send postcards like this. We sent in postcards like this, right? We wrote on them, we mailed them and guess what? We got picked. So the whole point is dare to be different. What does dare to be different mean? It means put yourself out there, take the risk, because this is my one chance to make a good impression. So I'm going to go and I'm going to hand write a thank you note. Some people say it's obnoxious. Guess what? I just need one firm to like me and I've got a job. Now, you get the first offer, awesome. You get a second job offer, that's even better. You get a third, now you're confused. Oh my gosh, I'm so confused. What do I do? It's a good problem to have, but again, let's just try to figure out a way to nail that first offer. Now, a lot of people say, okay, that's great, but I'm not sure if I want public or big four. Now, and a lot of times I ask students and I say, how many people want to work at the big four? And they go, I do. And I go, what do you know about the big four? And they go, they're big and there's four of them, right? Well, the purpose of Meet the Firms is to get the information about the different companies that are out there. What is the difference between big four, public, private, government? What is public accounting? That's where you go and you're doing audit. You're doing taxes. You're doing consulting. You're an external independent auditor. So you're auditing these things, giving an opinion on their financial statements. 1933, 1934 Federal Security Regulations Act says that if you are a public company, you're traded on a national exchange, you owe over 10 million in assets and 500 shareholders, you have to do a 10K, 10Q, 8K. You have to do this stuff. So we're always going to have a job in public accounting because SEC regulations and so on, we always need to have an audit done. So in public, you're an external independent auditor. So that's like working at a big four. That's working at a national firm, at a local firm. You could be doing audit, taxes, consulting. That's called public. 
What is private? Private is where you work internally within the company. Maybe I work at Boeing. Maybe I'm CEO, CFO, controller, bookkeeper, uh, IT person. So I work here, a financial analyst. I work within the firm. Now, I work within the firm. That means, can I own stock in the company? Yes, I can. If I'm in public, can I own stock? No direct financial, no material indirect, no. But if I'm working within the company, then I can own stock. So one of the cool things about private is you can have stock options. One of my friends works at Fox Studios. And what he does, he's in what we call participation accounting. So his job is to figure out on the back end of the movie how much the actor, writer, director, producer, how much money the people from Avatar get or from whatever movie. So the whole point is that he still started in in accounting, was in the accounting club with me. He went to Deloitte with me. And then he went off and went into, for example, Fox. So one of the cool things, he gets a parking spot, he gets to eat in the commissary and see all the movie stars, he gets to go to premieres, and he gets stock options. And if they do well, he gets a bonus, if the movies do well that year. So that's called private. You work within, what's some of the things? You go to the same location, you see the same people, and so on. In public, there's a little bit more variety. Like I would go on a job for four to six weeks, roll off, go to another client. Then you've got government. What is government? Government means you're working at the Franchise Tax Board, State Board of Equalization. Maybe you're working at um, the FBI, right? One of my friends works at the IRS. Now, what's good about government? Generally, you have a steady job, very little overtime, so maybe the average work week's 37 hours. Why is that? Because anytime there's a holiday and the post office is closed, guess what? You get the day off. (laughs) Um, The other thing, too, great benefit plans. Um, But again, you're not going to usually make as much money, but there's good job security. One of the cool things, one of my friends who works at the IRS, guess what? He gets to carry a gun on his ankle. On his ankle. That's kind of cool, right? Imagine you go to a club and go, hey, I'm Raj. Can I buy you a drink? And you put your leg up and you got a gun there. You know, when I worked at Deloitte, they never issued us a weapon, right? It wasn't like, freeze, right? I need your general ledger now, right? So the point is, public, private, governmental, All of these options are available to you because of the Accounting Association, because of Beta Alpha Psi, because of your studying of accounting. All of these are available to you. It's your job at this event, meet the firms, meet the professionals, to get out there and talk to the people who actually do this job day in and day out. So it's really important. That's why I highly encourage that you properly prepare you before you go to this event. Look, I tell students, look at this event like a midterm. In other words, you study for hours and hours before the midterm, but so many people go to meet the firms without preparing. I suggest you spend several hours doing the research on the firms, looking at yourself, dress properly, act professional, look in the mirror, look at yourself and say, how do I look? How do I act? Practice your handshake, practice your eye contact, practice your communication. Make sure, unlike me, you're not spitting on everyone when you talk. But these are all the little things that, again, you want to make a good first impression. Bring your breath mints with you. These little things separate you from everyone else. Again. I give seminars on how to write a resume, how to interview, how to communicate, how to give public speaking. All of these are great skills that are imperative in life. I always tell people you never know where life's going to take you. You know, when I started out at public, I wanted to be a partner and that was it. All of a sudden I realized I wanted to do all these different things. But all these skills that I learned from Deloitte and public accounting were skills that helped me in the real world as well and in establishing my own business. So I remember in college the Career Center came out and they said the average person changes careers five times. What does that mean? That means you need to get these skills now because you're going to be doing a lot of interviewing, a lot of resume writing, a lot of communication, a lot of presentations. You're going to be doing these often throughout your life. That means practice now. Practice makes perfect. Do it now while you're still in school. Do it now before the event occurs so that way you too can have a successful meet the firms and you too will have an amazing career in accounting. Let's talk a little bit about the CPA exam. Now what is the CPA exam? It is a 14 hour adventure. I always like to tell people it is not an IQ test. You don't have to be a genius to be a CPA. We all have friends that are CPAs. Are they geniuses? I don't think so, right? But it's a test of discipline. If you study, you will pass. My job is to motivate you for the three to four hundred hours of prep time it will take in order to get you through all four parts of the exam. What are the four parts of the exam? First of all, we have four parts, auditing, financial, regulation, and BEC. Now you can take them in any order. You can take them one part at a time. But auditing, I talked about earlier, is what? 
Auditing is basically where you pick up these financial statements. We have to be objective, independent, unbiased, neutral. We're going to give an opinion on these statements. So our job is to go out there and obtain this information. And then at the end, we can draft a report. It talks about SSARS, reviews, compilations, and so forth. So we talk about planning, internal control, substantive testing, IT, audit reports, governmental audits, special situations, special reports, uh, comfort letters, and so forth. All of these are part of the audit exam, which is a four-hour adventure. You've got FAIR, financial accounting, or FAR, FAR, a long way to run. What's FAIR? It's like intermediate one, intermediate two, advanced government nonprofit. So you've got intermediate one and two, you've got leases, pensions, bonds, deferred taxes, receivables, percentage of credit sales, aging of AR, direct write-off. You've got all of these areas. You've got advanced accounting, consolidations. You've got governmental accounting, modified accrual accounting. You've got nonprofit. All of that is all squeezed into one. So for example, this is one of the books that I've written. See, there's me. And basically, my job is to take all those areas, summarize, simplify, and focus you into one book, into what you need to know to get through financial accounting. We've got regulation, which is tax and law. It's about 60% tax, 40% law. Tax is what? Individual tax, your 1040. Schedule A, B, C, D, E. Schedule F even showed up. Now, I worked at Deloitte for many years. What is Schedule F? Farm income. I was in downtown LA. How many farms do you think I audited in LA? Nada, right? So I never saw it in the real world, but guess what? It shows up in the exam world, therefore you need to know it. So that's your 1040. You've got corporate, 1120, 1120 S-Corps, 1065 partnerships, 1031 like-kind exchanges, 6252 installment sales, uh, Schedule SE, self-employment, uh, different property, um, ordinary assets, 1231 assets, capital assets. All of that is part of tax, 60% of a three-hour exam. The other 40% is going to be business law and professional responsibilities. So it talks about business responsibilities. It talks about UCC uniform commercial code, negotiable instruments, commercial paper, things like uh, bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy chapter 7, chapter 11, chapter 13. All of that is part of bankruptcy. Then we've got BEC, which is also three hours, business environment and concepts. This is going to be economics, micro, macro. Now, they don't expect you to be Ben Bernanke, right? But they expect you to have an understanding understanding of micro macro micro supply demand macro looking at the overall economy business cycles right gdp gnp recession depression expansion contractions and so on we've got also financial management it a favorite area cost managerial Remember cost accounting? Variance analysis, direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, spending efficiency, volume variance. It's back. That's part of BEC. That's your 14-hour adventure. The way it's set up, and this started in 2011, is fair audit and reg are 60% multiple choice, 40% what we call task-based simulations, which are problems and research. BEC is 85% multiple choice and 15% what we call written communications or essays. And actually, the way Fair Audit and Reg, that's how it was when I took it. Because back in my day, when I was your age, when I took the exam, it was a 19 and a half hour, three day exam given twice a year. You had to sit for all four parts, you had to pass at least two parts, and you had to get at least a 50% on the parts not passed, or you kept nothing. So if you got a 99, 99, 99, 49, guess what? You kept nada. That means nothing in Spanish. Por supuesto. Now, you can study for a part, take a part. Study for a part, take a part. So it totally changes the way that people prepare for the exam. So now it's 60-40 and BEC 85-15. When can you sit for this exam? They have testing windows. Basically, months 3, 6, 9, and 12 are blackout months. There's no exam. The other eight months, you can take one or two or three or all four parts. So you can kind of book it like a doctor's appointment. I think I'll take financial in downtown on Wednesday in the afternoon. And then you go online to the Prometrics website. You book your exam. You sit for the exam. So what happens is with those testing windows you see there, in the first window, January, February, you could sit for one, two, three, or all four. You can't sit for the same part more than once in the window. You couldn't sit for audit in January and again in February. You can't sit again until the next window, which is April, May, and then July, August, and then October, November. Which window do you think is the busiest? November, right? Why? Because everyone procrastinates. It's New Year's Eve. 
dude, happy new year. Guess what? I'm going to become a CPA this year. And then what happens? You get busy season. Then what happens? You're done. And then you need a break. And then you go away. And then you go, oh my gosh, the year's almost over. I better study. So the last two weeks in November are always the busiest because people need to get through this exam. So it's really important to book early as far as when you're going to structure that exam. What are the educational requirements? Every state is different. On my website, rogercpareview.com, you can see a link to all the state boards and all the details. But basically, you generally need about 120 semester units to sit and about 150 to get certified. That's equal to 180 quarter units or 225 quarter units to get certified. So some states you need 150 to sit, some states you need 120 to sit, but 150 to get certified, at least 24 units in accounting. But again, there's 55 different jurisdictions and those talk about what the requirements are in each of those jurisdictions. How do you apply? You generally apply online, usually costs about $100 to apply and about $50 to do a repeat. You apply online, you send your transcripts in from all the schools that you've attended. It must say degree complete. So you've got to have a degree in hand, degree complete. Then they're going to match up your application, your 100 bucks or your entry fee, and your transcripts. They say, yes, everything's good. You get an ATT, which is an authorization to test. You now have 90 days to tell them which part you want to sit for for the length of your NTS called a notice to schedule. A notice to schedule in most jurisdictions is good for six months. Some states, like California, there's an exception, so that's good for more like nine months. Uh, other states, it's 12 months, but in most states, it's six months. So that means you're only going to pay for the parts you plan to sit for in the next what? In the next six months. So you'll see here, let's say the fees are you know, about $200 apart, more or less, and it goes based on time. The four-hour exams are more expensive, audit and fair. The three-hour reg and BEC are less expensive. So before I shell out almost 800 bucks, what I tell students is this. Don't pay all 800 bucks unless you're going to sit for them within your notice to schedule six months. So let's say I'm going to sit for two parts. What I tell people is sign up for two, pay the money, the 100 bucks, and the two parts, let's say 400 bucks. Now, that process takes, let's say, six weeks to get your notice to schedule. If you want to add another part, you're a repeat, they already have your information, it takes maybe a week. So what does that mean? I tell people sign up for the first two. If you want to add more, the repeat takes about a week. And that costs you $50 for the option. So it's kind of like an option contract for 50 bucks. Because otherwise, if you pay all 800 and you don't sit within six months, you forfeit the money. Most states, they would love that money, right? They all need money. You don't, can't afford it, so I would pay for two. You can always add more later on. Once you get your notice to schedule, then you contact Prometrics, and then you can book your exam. When you go to the event, you have to bring your notice to schedule. You have to bring a form of ID. This has been a problem with the, I just heard, I just came back from a meeting, in, um, with the Japanese locations. A lot of students would show up to the exam in Japan, because they now give it internationally, Japan, the Middle East, and so on. And they would show up, and guess what? They didn't have their proper ID with them. So you have to bring a, a valid ID, a photo ID. Your name on your ID has exactly matched your name on your notice to schedule, and you need a secondary ID as well in order to be admitted. All of this is also on my website. Then you take the exam, and then you get your scores. The scores are released as follows. If you were to sit, let's say, in October, November, they plan to release the scores at the end of, let's say, October, and then every two weeks thereafter. So that's the way that the scores will be released as it moves forward with the exam as you move on. What does it take to get certified? Generally, you pass the exam. You work for, in most states, about one to two years. In some states, as I said, in most, you need 150 semester or 225 quarter units in order to then be able to get your certificate. Now, I'm looking and feeling all the energy in the room. Everyone's like, Raj, I'm excited. You've motivated me. What do I have to do to pass the exam? Well, it is a major commitment of time, right? I, commitment, scary. It's about three to 400 hours of prep time. You're going to spend about 100 hours with someone like myself teaching you. And I spent about 120 hours in class walking through the material step by step by step. You can take my course online. I have a USB course. You plug it in. You can play it on your computer 24-7. I have locations. I stream to your home if you want to watch me live. These are all different ways you can watch me. But my job is to take difficult areas and summarize, simplify, and get you through the material. Now, I call it a review course, but I don't expect you to remember much, right? As long as you remember debits near the door, all right? I'll teach you the rest. 
The key is, I realize there's a lot of stuff in school you've never seen. So my job is to walk you through it to make sure that everything you need is there. So what I'll do is I'll walk you through it. Now, I tell people you need about three hours of study time for every one hour of lecture. So if I'm going to lecture to you, so let's say, for example, let's take a fun area like, ooh, here's bonds. Okay, so this is the book that I wrote. I talk about bonds. There's certain areas they test in bonds. Bonds, present value of bonds, amortization of discount or premium of bonds. So we'll talk about effective interest tables and so on. Then we'll talk about convertible bonds. We'll talk about bonds with detachable stock purchase warrants. Then we'll go through actual CPA exam questions and solutions. We'll go through multiple choice. We'll go through task-based simulation problems as well. So we'll do this. This will take about two hours of our time. So in two hours, I'll show you what you need about bonds to get through those questions. Then I send you home and I'll say, okay, now you're going to spend about six hours going through software and going through a homework book. I give you both a homework book and I give you software. This software has all the released AICPA questions and solutions. They got like 4,000 multiple choice and hundreds of simulation problems. That way, we'll go through questions together, multiple choice and simulations. Then you go home and spend three hours reading my notes and going through another 65 multiple choice and seven problems. Now that you've done, I understand bonds, one section down, 54 to go. So that's the way that I would walk you through as far as preparing for it. Now, what is the national average pass rate? About 49 to 50%. Wow. I get the highest verified pass rate of about 86%. If you do what I tell you to do, you're going to pass the exam. My job is to keep you motivated. My job is to take accounting and make it interesting. And I have students that sit at home and they write me thank yous that they'll sit and they'll watch it with their kids because I try to be energetic. And, and again, go to my website and watch the demos. Also, before your next college midterm, if you want to watch any of my lectures for free, leases, bonds, pensions, deferred taxes, governmental, audit, BEC, whatever, Contact my office and I'll give you access so you can see it'll help you in school and it'll help you pass the exam as well. The way my course works is basically I'll teach you the material, I'll give you the books I wrote, I'll give you all the different software that never expires. You can watch it live, online, on the USB, which is cool because you can plug this in and watch it 24-7. That's what'll get you through it. Also, I give you free homework help. What that means is you go to my message board if you have any homework questions and we will answer it within a day. That way we can help you. So it's kind of a full service. It's not like here's the material and study, but if you don't understand question 27, why is answer C wrong? You send me an email and within a day we'll get back to you as to why it is right or why it's wrong to help you get through it. The retail price of the course is about 2095 whether it's live, online, or USB. That also comes up to 18 months of active, so you can watch the course up to 18 months. On Conditional repeat has all the materials. We have a $16.95 student special, and that is if you put a hundred dollar deposit, it locks that price forever. If you decide 20 years from now I don't want to be a CPA, then we'll give you back your hundred dollars. If you decide I want to be a CPA and the price has gone up, you still get that $16.95 price. You just have a balance of $15.95. So that's like an option contract with no risk. I'm the only review course that does that. So you can lock in a price today because if after you graduate you want to take it, it's over $2,000. But if you lock it in while a student, it's only $16.95. As I said earlier, I'm the fastest growing course in the country and the world. I have locations all over the country. I have students all over the world as well. I have contracts with the big four, national, local, governmental agencies, private companies, and so forth. But again, talk to anyone who's taken my course. They love it. Look at my website. I have thousands of testimonials about my teaching style, my materials, the course, my, um, uh, when you call my office, my customer service, very friendly, very knowledgeable. But again, there's a reason I'm the fastest growing course, because it works. Again, I want to thank you so much for your time. I hope you learned a lot about Meet the Firms and also about the CPA exam. And as I said, if you study, you will pass this exam. And please have a wonderful career in accounting.